flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Give me three minutes, three minutes. How y'all doing this morning? I got about two minutes before we start, so let's get started before I start. How's that? All right? <laughs> Good to see y'all. You're all smiling. Everybody doing well. Uh, we've talked about Doug Fairchild. I just talked to him on the phone a little bit ago. He's got stage four lung cancer um, in any way. So he's, a, he's sitting in a chair right now in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, I think it is, anyway, getting his third tr chemo treatment. So anyway, so uh, you, you, and that's, they let him take a week off so he could go down to San Antonio. He wanted to be with his grandson as he graduated. I think the San Antonio Air Force something, who knows what it is. Anyway, um, you, you, you have a lot of people to pray for. If you want to put Doug on your thing, it's him and his wife, Kathy. So, you know, he was here a couple months ago and he, when he left, he found out he had stage four cancer and it's like, boom, you know. Pete will tell you all about it. So anyway, we're praying for him. Who knows what will happen? God's in control. We're thankful for that. But there's a lot of other things you're praying about as well. I just want you to have a picture of that today and uh, put that in your mind and in your heart. Everybody ready? 
Where are we going today? Temple. The temple. The temple is destroyed. Not this one. Not this one. All right. <laughs> All right. Make sure you talk to David here. He's got a picture of the... He's a surfer in the background, all right? He's got a picture of a record surfer, right? Is that right? That's a woman. She just set a new record, 73-foot wave or something. He, he gets into all that. He understands it all. I just stand back and try to figure it out why you'd be smart enough to get on all those things. But anyway, <laughs> she made it. She lived, just broke her ankle. But other than that, she, she made it, set a new record. So... Good to see you all today. Uh, some of you are back, and we have a new couple over here, Jimbo and Lori, and uh, Ray Rayon, Rion. say your name. Rion. Rion, got it, okay. I'm, I don't, people, some people have really weird names. <laughs> it's so hard for me to pronounce them, so I like guys like Smith and Jack and whatever, so that's good. She's going to turn it on in a minute, so I'm going to look to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get started here today, so let's pray. Father, thank you. In one sense, we're really troubled, maybe even, by the world around us, or we're concerned, or we're sorrowful, or whatever it is. Uh, we look at Doug, he's got stage four cancer, and on and on it goes. So some things really um, are discouraging to us, and, and yet in the midst of that all, we're so joyful and so happy, and we have gladness of heart, and uh, we're, we know that's all because we understand the end from the beginning is in your hand. And we understand that uh, eternal life is a great thing. We understand this world's just not our home. We're passing through. And there'll be a day when there'll be no more sorrow and no more tears and no more crying. And, and we're looking forward to that. And uh, so we thank you for that. Help us today as we study your word to understand it correctly. Um, what we don't understand, help us not to make assumptions on. What we do, help us to be confident it's true. And just help us to enjoy this study of Ezekiel chapter 40. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Ezekiel chapter 40 through 43, by the way, Sunday they were giving out this book. I got two more left and there's 50 more coming, right? And if you have not gone through grasping the gospel with somebody, you ought to do that. And more and more people are doing that. So I'm just encouraged by that. So I hope you, if you want to do it with me, that's great. Or Lynette does it with people all the time. Just do one-on-one -on -one with somebody and then you do it with somebody else, all right? So Jimbo and Lori are going to do it with Lynn and Lenny and Jim. And so we just got to have that happening in our church. We're all just working with others and making disciples. So make sure you take care of that. But today, we're in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 43. We st skipped Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39. And the reason we do that, because Sunday morning, I'm going to do Ezekiel 37. And then the next Sunday morning, Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is Gog and Magog. And I know that's the only reason you came to the study of Ezekiel for Gog and Magog. I know that. So I'm dragging it out as long as I can keep your attention. So we're jumping over those chapters to chapter 40 through 43. To help you understand it, you understand this is probably the most famous picture if you go to Israel, especially Jerusalem, and it's called Temple Mount. And you realize that on it, there's another picture of it going around it is that. You understand how big it is? Each one of those blocks, which is, I don't know how tall that is, 50 feet, 100 feet, whatever it is. It's huge, it's huge, it's huge. And so you understand that uh, that's just, when you go to Israel, you got to go there, right? And you all get your picture taken with that in the background. So Temple Mount. If you think about it, there are some temples in history. And some of you understand them all and know them all. But if you haven't, it's something like this. The first one was really a tabernacle, which is the word tent. And it was made by Moses' people in the book of Exodus, chapter 25 through chapter 40, especially chapter 26. And uh, if you read it, you'd realize in Exodus chapter 26, it's very specific, and it goes something like this. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen, blue, purple, scarlet thread, artistic design of the cherubim. You shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits. And you read chapter 26, and you're like, man, I don't like reading this. It's all cubits and dimensions and how many and all that. Very, very specific. And you know what they did? They made it. And there's an image of it. Who knows if it's quite right, but it's pretty close. Here's another one inside with a holy place. And then the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. In the holy place was some other things. Outside were some other things. And you could read all about it. 
And you could uh, understand it from Exodus chapter 25. It may have looked like this. It was movable as the children of Israel moved around. And there are dimensions to it. And you can just read all about that in Exodus chapter 25 through chapter 40. And as far as I know, everybody in the whole world believes that that actually existed. Any Christian, I should say, right? Anybody who reads the Bible believes it's true would say, there was a day when there was a tabernacle in the days of Moses, and it lasted until Solomon, as you know. David wanted to build the temple, a permanent dwelling place for God. God, you're too good. I have a nice palace, but you don't, you know. God says, no, you're a man of war. I'm going to have your son do that. So the next one is what's called Solomon's temple, his original temple, permanent dwelling place. This is a model of it. Who knows if it's quite right, but it's pretty close. Most of these models, uh, there would be a tall entryway, whether it was like the first one or the second one. And you can read about that in Second Chronicles, chapter 1 through chapter 7, and especially chapter 2 and 3. And so to tell you the dimensions and the height and how many layers and all that kind of stuff. And um, you would realize um, it would, you can draw it out. Okay? That's why they can make models of it, because you read it. So the tabernacle, if you've ever been with the Amish in Lancaster, you can go to the, they have a huge model of it. They just did it up right. It'll really impress you. You can read the Bible, and then you can go make it. Now, there are some things that may be not quite right. that You might think it's this and I'm that, but by and large, you have to come up with the same, same thing. So there was Solomon's temple, probably about 960 B.C. is when he built it, uh, maybe 950, something like that. And as you read through it, it's something. But you realize that was destroyed in 586, which is, according to Ezekiel here in chapter 40, which was 14 years before what we're going to read about today. The Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in and destroyed it. So that one was destroyed. Zerubbabel came back and, I mean, Zerubbabel, yeah, Zerubbabel came back and rebuilt it in 517 AD or BC. So there was that one. You remember and Ezra recorded it. And when the people who had seen the first one saw the foundations of the rebuilt one, what did they do? They wept. So there was one group that was, yay, going and praise the Lord. And the other group who had seen the first one go, wow, man, did we end up with second rate. And so this is Zerubbabel. So Herod took care of that. You can read about that in several places, but John chapter 2 in verse 20, we'll say this temple has been 46 years in the building, all right? So the temple mount that we see today was built by Herod. He expanded the area. He uh, renovated the temple from Zerubbabel's day, which was kind of a not such a great one, apparently. And he made it magnificent for the Jews. And if you go to Jerusalem today, they actually have this motto of the city of Jerusalem. And it's really cool. You can walk around and you can see there's Temple Mount and there's the Temple of Herod, the Magnificent. He was quite a builder. And so you have his temple. may have looked exactly like this or partially like this. You can see people walking in the background. You can see how big this motto is. It's like acres, all right? And whoever built it is something. And then they all moved it. <laughs> the first time we went in 1987, that, temp- that model was in one location and we went back in 2000, and they had moved the whole thing, every piece, to a whole new place. I don't know how they did it the first time, but I don't know how they did it the second time. It's really impressive. That's Herod's temple, and you actually can draw it. It has dimensions. It was real, et cetera, et cetera. So if you go there today, however, you recognize on Temple Mount, you see this other building, and everybody knows that to be the, the Dome of the Rock, the third most holy place for Muslims. It's where uh, Muhammad, on his horse, left and went to heaven, according to their understanding of things. If you get to go up there, you can. I've walked in it. It's got a mountain there, Mount Moriah, where we would say um, Abraham offered Isaac, or as they would say, Abraham offered Ishmael. So that's the whole difference between Christians and Muslims. Everything you know about Isaac, they say, we corrupted the Bible that it really is Ishmael. So all the promises of God through Abraham are through Ishmael, which are the Arab people, okay? And we say, no, it's through Isaac, which is the Jewish people. So on top of it all there, you can read it, and no, you can't read it because I can't read it. It's in Arabic, 
There's a million curses of the Jews on that, with that wall. But you can go in there. It's really a cool place. It's huge, actually. It's really quite something. And that's what's there today. So that was 691 A.D., I think, something like that it was built. And that's where the big conflict is today in Jerusalem because they are not going to give that one up. And the Jews, you know, want the Temple Mount. So there's a little bit of a conflict going on, at least externally. So that's what you'd see today. If you go there today, however, you can see the Dome of uh, Rock in the background. There's another older mosque behind that one that you can go in as well. But in the wall here called the Western Wall, you'd see always see all these Jews and they're praying. There's a place for the men and there's a place for the women and they put all their little prayers in all the niches and, and they just sit there and read the scriptures and they do it for reasons and, and they have Old Testament biblical reasons why they shake their head and all that kind of stuff. And so they're just constantly praying, but they do it at that specific location because in their understanding of things, that's the closest they can get to the location where Solomon's temple was, all right? So nobody's completely sure. There's a lot of debate on where Solomon's temple actually was, uh, whether it's where the Dome of the Rock was or a little bit south of it. So it's very realistic to assume someday there'll be the Dome of the Rock and a Jewish temple side by side on top of that mountain. And uh, so that's probably that. But you understand that they're there. And as, you, as you're there and, and watch them, you realize they, they wanted to be re, as close as they could be to where Solomon's temple was, because that's really, really special to the Jewish people. And you realize that in their mind, someday, if they get their way, they're going to build a new temple. All right? So this is one, you know, just superimposed on Temple Mount. Could be that they have to tear down the Dome of the Rock to do it, but more than likely they won't have to. They can actually put it next to it, and the Muslims and the Jews can live at peace with one another. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe not. But it's possible geographically for something like that. In fact, when you go to Jerusalem today, you can go down to where they, the Jew, certain Jewish people have put together all the things for when this temple is built, they have it all ready to go, all right? They have the, you can walk through this building. They have the priestly garments. So as soon as they got that temple down, they're going to have priests. They got the garments all made. They're ready to go. You can watch them. Look at them. They have all the Urim and the Thummims and the... And they got it all ready to go. Everything you read about, they have the uh, Ark of the Covenant. They have, and it's all gold. You know, they have quite a few guards at the door <laughs> as you go in. Because just imagine how much gold there is there. And, and you can see the Ark of the Covenant that they've made and all the vestments for the priests and for the workers and all that kind of stuff. And Day of Atonement, there's another picture of the Ark of the Covenant. The menorahs, the, the bronze. Uh, lavers for the sacrifices, they got it ready to go. They have it ready to go. Um, in fact, they have it so ready to go that uh, I found out about somebody in Paris, you know, what will the music be like in, the, in this temple, right? The Jews hope for it. So what was the temp music like in Solomon's day? So there's this lady, if you go to Paris, and you have an address that's in the, like the weirdest place in town you can go. You go up the stairs, and you go up another set of stairs, and you go up another set of stairs, and you finally get to, like, in their world, Paris, fourth level is the top. It's in the attic, and she's living up there. And she thinks she's got the music of David and Solomon. So she gave me a tape. It is the weirdest music you've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, if we played that on Sunday, you'd all leave. Right? It, it, it is, but she's convinced that she has rediscovered the music. So they have the music, they have the instruments, they have all of that. All that to say, they really are looking forward to a new temple. So why in the world would they have any hope of a new temple with all of these things? They're ready to go. We're ready to do it. What, what would possess the Jewish people to think about that? Well... There's some things in the Bible that might hint, you, hint to you that there's going to be someday a new temple. Isaiah 2, 2. <clears throat> it shall come to pass in the last days that the mount of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Isaiah said it. So in the last days, there's going to be this 
house of the Lord, this temple, if you would. You can go to Micah chapter 4, verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and people will flow to it. You understand in the geography of Israel, you know, the, the mountains are the backbone and Jerusalem's on the top. So Jerusalem is really the tallest, highest place in, in, in Israel, basically, other than one other place. And so that's why, in spite of the fact that Jerusalem, which is a city of about a million people today, uh, has no river, it has no harbor, it has no rain, train station, and it has no airport. And like, who would build a capital there? <laughs> you know, why would you ever build a city there? It's on top of the mountain, highest place, with no reason in the world to build a, your city there. It is very special to Jewish people because God said, that's where I'm going to build my house. So they have some verses of scripture that would give them some indication that someday in the last days there will be a temple restored. And so um, we are going to think about that because today we're going to go to Ezekiel in chapter 40 through 43 today and next week 44 through 48. And as you go through Ezekiel, you understand that in this last section, the book of consolation is he says, we're going to you know, regather you into the land. We're going to regenerate your hearts. We studied that last week. You're going to be new people with new spirit within you, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is great because the people are changed and the, the people are in the land and it will flow with milk and honey and all that kind of stuff. But he also says now in these chapters something about the millennial temple and the millennial city and the millennial land, all right? So as you read it, to you and me, um, one thing I like about um, liberals, all right, when, when I talk about liberals theologically, they don't believe there's a God. They don't believe the Bible was written by God, it was written by men, all right. So I have a lot of problems with liberals, all right, <laughs> yeah. But the thing I love about them is when they read the Bible, they tell you exactly what it says. They are right on. And they say, of course, it's not true. <laughs> but if you just forget about their last paragraph, all the rest of their commentary is as good as it gets. They, they just take it word for word. It says what it means. It means what it says. It's just not true. So I'm with them that it means what it means. It says what it says, but I differ. I think it is true, all right? So Merle Unger, who is not a liberal by any means, he was, you have Unger's Dictionary and some other things, uh, Dallas professor years and years ago, the final nine chapters of this prophecy of Ezekiel, while forming a grand climax to the prophet's message, presents difficulties which place them among the most perplexing portions of the entire prophetic word. So as we read this today, uh, many people would say, this is very perplexing. But it won't be perplexing to understand what it says. A 10-year-old boy can read it, a girl can read it, and tell you what it says. It's perplexing like it can't mean that. How in the world could that possibly be? It can't be that. So we're going to look at them. We're going to go kind of rapidly through these four chapters. We won't read every verse, all right, because if I did, I would lose you <laughs> about 10 minutes in. Uh, it's kind of one of those chapters like so many in the Bible is like, oh man, God, you should have left that one out. But you understand he puts it in because it's important. He didn't waste ink here. He put it in here because as boring as it may be to you, somehow it's really, really important. So I'd encourage you. Now, if you're an engineer or an architect, any architects here? Any engineers here? All right, you'll love it best chapters in the Bible. You'll love it, all right? Ezekiel chapter 40, we're going to think about it. In chapter 40, it's the temple complex. Chapter 41 will be the temple sanctuary. Chapter 42, the temple chambers. And chapter 43 is the temple purpose. And that's just to give you a quick outline of what's going to happen here today. Uh, we're going to read some of the verses and we'll, we'll figure it out. Something like this in chapter 40, verse 1. In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was captured. So the city of Jerusalem has, was destroyed in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. They 
burned it to the ground. They leveled it down. They threw the stones off the walls. On and on it goes, all right? So 14 years later, now Ezekiel's remember in the ex, with the exiles in Babylon along the river Shabar. And so a lot of Jews are there. And so now God, 14 years after the temple's gone, and you remember Daniel and so many of the Jews, they always prayed towards the temple. You know, that temple is the, where the presence of God was, right? We understand from Ezekiel 8, 9, and 10 that the glory of the Lord left, Ichabod, we studied that, but they still had this respect for the temple of God, but now it's gone. It's wiped out. It's, it's disappeared. So he wants to tell you that. And that very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there, and we can debate how he did it and whether he really went there or if this is a vision or whatever. But it says this, In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of, of fat flax. And so you understand, uh, you remember in Ezekiel chapter 1, God in a vision allowed him to see something of the presence of God and the person of God and all those kind of things. So there's some words that are similar. So now, 14 years after Jerusalem's gone, or the temple's gone and Jerusalem's gone, and thousands and thousands of Jews have died, that God allows him to see in a vision, not sitting on a mountain overlooking what we would call Jerusalem, but he never calls it that, and then the temple area he sees this person like the person he saw in chapter 1, which was like the presence of God, like, you know, should encourage us. Like, this is not just some goofball coming up with some goofball things. This is God talking to you. This is very important. Now he's got a line of flax. Anybody here uh, have measuring tapes? So when I was a surveyor, we had a 100-footer and I had a 300-footer. So my wife and I surveyed together. She always had the front end. I always had the back end, you know. So she'd be 300 foot in front of me as we're going down a road measuring, you know. So that's what a line of flax is. It's one of those long things. So if you're going to measure long distance, you need a 300 foot chain, right? Or a 100 foot or something like that. So he had a line of flax. Also this, he said in verse 3, and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. He's going to tell us about that measuring rod in just a little bit. He said, man, and the man said to me, son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and fix your mind on everything I show you, for you were brought here so that I might show them to you, and you're going to declare to the house of Israel everything you see. Now there was a wall and all around the outside of the temple, and the man's hand was a measuring rod, six cubits long, each being a cubit and a hand breadth. So a cubit, of course, is from tip of your finger to your elbow, right? <laughs> Typically, 18 inches is the number we usually throw. But what, there was an extended, a long cubit <laughs> in Jewish way. There was a short cubit and long cubit. The long cubit was that plus a hand breadth. So it'd be like 22 and a half inches, let's say. So if you have a rod that's six of those, that's over 10 foot. So I might, you and I might not know exactly if it's 10 foot six and a half inches or 10 foot six inches or whatever, but we, it's a very real measuring rod, Okay. And it's somewhere around 10 to 10 and a half feet long. So he has this line of flax. I can measure long distance. I have a rod. And we understand a cubit. And he's using the, the extended cubit. All right. So why does he have to tell you all this stuff? Look, I don't care if you've got a line of flax. I don't care if you've got a rod standing around. I don't care. Well, it's because God's going to show him something. And he's got to measure it all up. And then he's got to tell the children of Israel what God let him see, all right? And you go, I don't need these chapters, but you do need them. So just let it sink in, okay? And so here's Ezekiel in a vision in Jerusalem or in the place where the temple is, and uh, there's these measuring rods and this guy who's going to measure them, and I'm going to read a little bit of it, and I want you to just write down in your mind any word that helps you uh, to describe what, what I'm saying, okay? Uh, you all have a look on your face like, what in the world is he talking about here? Like, might be, that's big. You can write down the word big. But any word, I came up with 20 of them. So just don't try, to, just your 10-year-old kid hearing it for the first time. Just, whoa, that's big or whatever. Ready? 
Here we go. Verse 6, he went to the gateway, which faced east, and he went up the stairs and measured the threshold of the gateway, which was one rod wide. The other threshold was one rod wide. Each gate chamber was one rod long and one rod wide. And between the gate chambers, I told you you wouldn't enjoy this. All right, we're just going to talk about rods and gates and whatever, right? And a space of five cubits and the threshold of the gateway by the vestibule on the inside gate was one rod. And he measured the vestibule with its, uh, the inside gate, one rod. And he measured the vestibule on the, of the gateway, eight cubits. And the gateway, it's two cubits. The vestibule of the gate was on the inside. In the eastern, you got it all right. You got it in your head? Got it all pictured, right? Here we go. Verse 10. In the eastern gateway were three gate chambers on one side and three on the other, and the three were all the same size. Also, the gate posts were of the same size of this side and that side, and he measured the width of the entrance of, to the gateway, 10 cubits, and the length of the gate, 13 cubits, and there was a space in front of the gate chambers, one cubit of, on this side, one cubit on that side. Each gate chamber was six cubits, and he just goes on and on and on and on and on. He's going to talk about the eastern gateway, the southern gateway, the northern gateway, the walls and how thick they are and how tall they are, and the vestibules and the chambers, and you've got to go here to go there, and how many cubits and how many rods and how many lines of flax they are, and he's just going to go on and on and on, and if we had time today, I might read it off for you. <laughs> but... As you read chapter 40, you have a sense that he's talking about the temple complex. There's an exterior wall. It's got a gate on the east, gate on the south, gate on the north. It's got vestibules. It's got gateways. It's got walls. It's got three stories here. It's got chambers here. The priests can sit here. Um, if I could read it all, you would see in chapter 40, verse 6 through 27, it's the outer courts and gates are described in great detail. Chapter 40, verse 28 through 49, it's the inner courts and their use. So one of the things you'll catch is dimensions, purposes, what they're used for, how they relate. You go through the vestibule to get to the chamber, you go to the chamber to go to the whatever. It's all there, all right? So, oops, I just gave you my words. What strikes you? Precise. Pardon me? Precise. Precise. Exactly. It's very precise, all right? I mean, it's, he spends so much time telling us how many cubits it is, how many rods it is. It's like, I don't care. There's a gate there. Let's go in. You know, it's kind of like, but he has a specific and it's a precise. Precise is a great word. Another word. Pardon me? Detailed. Very detailed, all right? So detailed that you actually can get a, if you're an engineer or an architect and you have a piece of paper, you can draw this. And you'll be right on. He doesn't leave them off, right? He doesn't say, there's a gate. I don't know how big it is, but just put a gate there. You know, it's, it's on the south or on the east, on the north. It's so many feet from that and it's so high and it's so many rods. I mean, you can, if you're an architect, an engineer, you can draw this thing. So it's precise, it's detailed. Important. What do you mean by what's that? Exact. exact. Good. Complete. Complete. Not reading. <laughs> All right. That's pretty good. All right. Good. Costly. All right. Is that what you said? All right. Good. Yeah. This is no small thing. Purposeful. I like that one. I missed that the first time I read through it. I had all the dimensions, and I thought, I could draw this one out. You know, this would be cool. And they all have a purpose and a use. And this is the chamber for the priest, and this is where the people are, and this is where you store that. And, you know, everything has a purpose. Organized. Organized. I like that one. Consist consistent? Yeah. All right. Symmetric. Now you understand. Go ahead, Chrissy. Not negotiable. Not negotiable. <laughs> Whoever's going to build this one, here's the way, you know. God given. Well, you could come up with a thousand of them. It's detailed, specific. It's buildable. You could actually ask somebody to build this one, and they could do that. 
it's realistic. You know, it's not like the gates are a million foot wide. You know, it's, it's like very realistic that people could walk through and people could function in it. It's focused. All the lines, uh, if, if you had an architect here, if John Saylor was here, he'd get all excited about it, you know, because all the, all the floors go up, all the walls come in, all the ceilings go down, and it's going to focus on one little spot. So all your eye lines, you know, uh, are, and it's symmetric, the north and south. There's nothing on the west. So you understand in the, in the Middle East, especially for Jews, they, we are northerly oriented. That's the way we always have a map with the north on, at the top. They always have the east on the top. So when you look at a map of Israel, you go, oops, they missed it. <laughs> I will always turn a map of Israel this way. <laughs> but everything in the Bible is easterly oriented. The gates... The doors of the temple, it's always to the east, all right? So they're an easterly oriented people, and this one's built that way. You could probably put down a whole bunch of other things. It's orderly. God is a God of order. It's specific. He doesn't just say, build a nice door there. Whatever you want to do is fine. He's, this is what I want. Um, it's purposeful. It's not just a waste of energy. Uh, you probably can't catch it, but it's huge. In fact, this is one of the reasons why reading this chapter, you're going to say, huh, that's huge. <laughs> it's so much bigger than Solomon's. It's so much bigger than anything you've ever known in life that it's like, huh, he must have got it wrong. All right? So that's, that's what you find. In fact, uh, I drew this up for you. Not really. <laughs> Not really. There's an outer wall, eastern gate, northern gate, southern gate. The temple is going to be in the middle. Um, the chamber's on the side. And it's got the, you know, it's all there. You can actually draw this one up, all right? Just like you could draw up the tabernacle in Exodus or, or Solomon's temple in first, Second Chronicles in chapter 1 through 7. I mean, it's got dimensions, it's got heights, it's got levels, it's three layers here and whatever it is, and there's stairs up and seven up. I wrote a whole list of things that I, you can just punch out if you wanted to, but you, you catch it, right? right? So chapter 40 is the temple complex, or courts, if you would, outer and inner court, and it helps you to get the big picture of that. If we go to the Chapter 41, we're going to go to the sanctuary, if you remember that. In the, in the middle of this is going to be the, the temple proper, if you would, the temple sanctuary, if you would. So if you go to chapter 41, uh, we're going to go to that. Then he brought me into the sanctuary and measured the doorpost, six cubits wide on one side, six cubits wide on the other side, the width of the tabernacle, the width of the entryway, ten cubits, the side walls of the entrance were five cubits, da 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 Verse 4, this is the most holy place. So in verse 1 and 2, he describes the entry into the sanctuary. In verses uh, 3 and 4, it's the most holy place. So it's going to be, you go, let's, that's, that's a little different than what was in the tabernacle with a holy place and the most holy place. And it's a little different than Solomon's temple, which was like the tabernacle, holy place, and the most holy place. I mean, there's, you're going to go, okay, this is a little different. There's some things different about this one. Chapter 41, verse 5 through 11, the side chambers. All right, and he measures them and how long they are. And there are three stories in verse 6, one above the other, 30 chambers on each story. He has how many chambers, how many stories, uh, what their purpose is and usefulness. So you can just read through that, the doors, the terrace, uh, verse 10, the thickness of the outer wall. It's very specific, and all the things you said about the first one, it's going to be the same thing, all right? And then in chapter four, 41, verse 12, uh, through the end of the chapter is, maybe we could call it the back buildings and the, the separating terrace. So um, you realize that he, again, is describing something. So when we ask the question, what strikes you, <laughs> you have all the same things, Right? It's specific, it's detailed, it's organized, it's purposeful, it's focused. Uh, it's, you know, whatever you said before, it, it's there again and again. You could, you could draw a picture of it. And if you had some good masons and good carpenters and whatever, they could actually build it. 
No. It's got a few problems, doesn't it? Yeah, God made a mistake in that chapter, but we'll get to that. <laughs> but that's very good. Yeah, that's good. Because there are some differences. And some of you are catching that. Like, if you read it carefully, you'd go, oh, wow, where's the Ark of the Covenant? You know, where's whatever, okay? And that's important, all right? So you can actually draw. It's chapter 41 is a temple sanctuary. We could spend more time on it. Uh, but we're going to go to chapter 42, which are the temple chambers, if you want to call them that, or the approaches. Again, I'm not going to read through it, but if you looked at it, verses 1 through 14, it's the, it's the chambers for the approach of the priest. It's where the priests need to be, because whenever they're... So we're talking about priests in a temple, and they have to do their priestly work, all right? And then verse 15 through 20, it's the approach of the people. How do the people... Not the priest, but how the people approach this situation and the dimensions and all that kind of stuff. And um, you, could, you could understand it. The dimensions, by the way, are 500 rods by 500 rods. And remember, a rod is 10 feet. So now we're talking about one mile by one mile. That's a pretty good chunk of land. All right, so we're not talking about those little... If you go to Jerusalem today, Temple Mount is huge, but it's not a mile by a mile. It's not even close to a mile by a mile. It's not even in the ballpark of a mile by a mile. It's much smaller. Okay? So you could go chapter 42. We won't read it. Uh, I'll just read verse 13. The north chambers and the south chambers, which are opposite the separating courtyard, are the holy chambers where the priest who approach the Lord shall eat the holy, most holy offering. So he's just going to be very detailed instructions about this is where the priests go and they get ready to do their work and they're going to make offerings. So we now have a temple, we have offerings, we have priests, okay? Um, and then how the people approach, verse 15 through 20, you have chapter 42. And uh, again, if you ask the question what strikes you, it's all the same things, right? Very specific, very organized, very God-directed, I'm the boss, I drew it up, you guys go build it, or you guys go do it this way. Always remember form is supposed to match function. If you're an engineer and if you're an architect, function matches form. So that's the difference between an engineer and an architect right there. We always want it to work. They always want it to look good. That's why I never could work with those architects. They were always worried about it looking right. I said, I don't care what it looks like, but it's going to stand up. And it's going to function. And everything functions here in the chambers for the priest and where they have to do the sacrifices. I mean, whoever designed this, and of course we know who designed it, really had this one thought through. This is going to work. This is really well laid out. So we have the chambers, and again, all those things strike you. And then we get to chapter 43. I just want to spend a little bit of time here. Uh, and then we'll jump over to, so what's this all about? So chapter 43, and afterward he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces the east, remember everything's easterly oriented, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shook with his glory, it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to, de to destroy the city, so remember early on in Ezekiel he had visions, and now he's like, I'm seeing it again. So remember Ezekiel chapter 8, 9, 10, and 11, the glory of the Lord left the Holy of Holies, went to the lintels of the door, went to the, and finally went to the Mount of Olives, and finally just left, and nobody noticed. And now he's watching, and the glory of God came back and is going to go into this temple. So he must have been kind of excited. You know, we lost the glory of the Lord, but we're getting them back, right? And the glory of the Lord, verse 4, came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Sounds very similar, but not identical to what happened when they built the tabernacle, remember? And they got done, and the glory of the Lord walked into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And then when Solomon got done, you remember... You know, you all stood back, we're all done working, 
glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now from this point on, none of you go in there, except the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. So we have all this stuff going on, you can understand it. And you realize, and the Spirit of the Lord lifted me up, verse 5, and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and I heard him speaking to me from the temple. As you read that, I think the first six verses, so you realize this whole thing is for what purpose? It's where God's going to live, or at least the Shekinah glory of God. So sometimes we say God, sometimes we say Shekinah glory because God is everywhere present and all that kind of stuff, right? But there was a place where the, the, the Shekinah glory dwelled. It was in the Holy of Holies in the temple, right? Between the cherubim and whatever. And so suddenly what they lost is going to be restored, so we're talking about whatever you want to think about this, but this temple is where the Lord lives, the glory of the Lord lives, the Shekinah glory. In verse 7 through verse 11 or 12, it goes like this, and he said to me, Son of man, this is, the, this is the place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. By the way, how long is forever again? It's like a long time. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, they nor their kings, by their harlotry or the carcasses of their kings in their high places. So whatever this is, whenever this happens, um, that's it. No more, <laughs> you know. Are we going to have you guys defile my name, defile my place? It's not going to happen anymore. I'm coming. This is like forever. This is like permanent. Verse 8, and when they set their their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost with a wall between me, them and me they defiled my holy name by the abomination so he's, this is God talking he says you know what they did here was where I was in the holy of holies in the temple right Solomon's and so and then they put remember they were worshiping all those idols in the back room we read about that in Ezekiel and, and some other places so the Jewish people had ended up like, this is where God and Jehovah lives, but in the back room, we're doing this. And it was all kinds of idolatry and bad stuff. He says, that's where they did, but not anymore. And he says, as you read through this, um, let them put away their idolatry, their carcasses. Verse 10, Son of Man, describe this temple to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquity and let them measure the pattern. So now Ezekiel is going to have to go back to his exiles in Babylon Jerusalem's gone 14 years ago. It got destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. He said, I just got to tell you the end of the story. God allowed me to see there's going to be this temple, a mile by a mile complex. It's huge in the temple, and God's glory is going to go back into it, and never again <laughs> is God leaving. And never again are you guys going to defile my name. And never again... Are you going to have idolatries in the back room? All right? It's not going to happen. So it, it describes for us in these 12 verses, uh, verse 12, for example, this is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountaintop is most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. So we have the Lord's residence where he lives, the glory of the Lord lives, and his, and his reign. And then as you read from verse 13 down through the end of the chapter, I'll just read a couple of those verses. Verse 13, these are the measurements of the altar, so now we're talking about priest, temple, presence of God, and an altar. Before he had said, these are the chambers, and this is where the priest will kill the sacrifices. Like, okay, we're going to sacrifices, all right? And there's an altar. You could read about it, the height of it, the width of it, the height of the altar, verse 13, from the base of the ground, verse 14, on the ground to the lower ledge, and he describes it all cubits and rods and whatever. Verse 18, he said to me, Son of man, thus is the Lord God. These are the ordinances for the altar on the day when it is made, for sacrificing burnt offerings on it and for sprinkling blood on it. And you can read down through there and how many days, seven days, etc., etc. Okay? So you have in chapter 43, the Lord's residence, the glory of God walks in and fills it forever he's not leaving this time his reign you guys are never again going to do that nonsense called idolatry in the back room and we're going to do something in this complex 
called sacrificing with blood offerings so you'll never forget. All right? So you could read through it. A 10-year-old kid could read through it. Anybody can read through it, and you'd all end up with the same thing. You can draw pictures of it. It's, you know how big it is. You know how high it is. You know how many chambers there are. You know how many stories there are. You know how the steps go up. You know, you know all that stuff. You know its uses. This is where the priest will come in, and that's where the people come in. This is what's going to happen. You, can, you, you just got to, you, you can read it. It's like real. <coughs> it's like a real description. So he saw this as a vision, all right? So then the question is, uh, how, how are they and Ezekiel, and, and how are we supposed to understand this? So you recognize that this is where Monk Merle Unger, who is like us, but he recognized this is, this messes with our theology. All right? So especially if you're covenant theology, this, this is a bad section. You don't read this on Sunday morning because you don't know what to do with it. All right? So you understand that there's been, how are we supposed to understand this? What was really going on? What did, what's the message here? What really happened here? So if you take the time, you'd realize that probably there are uh, five, there may be more, but I think you could summarize them in five different ways of understanding them. Some people would say, this is a vision of Solomon's temple. It had been destroyed. The people are all discouraged. He's talking to the exiles and, you know, the Jewish exiles in Babylon. They're all discouraged. The temple's gone. And so he's, gonna, he's just going to describe for them Solomon's temple to encourage them and, and say, you know, this is, this is what it's like, guys. We lost it, but it was what it was like. Now, I think you would catch that there's a few problems with that in my book. Number one, why would you tell him about what you had in the past? That might make you feel good, but I don't know how that helps me in the future. So, you know, if something in the past was glorious, and now we're in despair because the present isn't so good, so it's nice to always look back and say, boy, we had it great back then. Boy, we had it great back then. But after a while, I'm tired of hearing about how good it was, you know, the good old days, right? How does it help me today when I have to look to the future, all right? Secondly, the dimensions are wrong. They don't fit Solomon's. They're too big. Um, some things are missing. I mean, it, it's similar. The tabernacle, the temples were all similar. But this one's not identical. So the first view is that it's Solomon's temple. He's just telling him what Solomon's temple was like to encourage him. You guys have been in exile for over 70 years. You probably never saw it. Let me tell you what it used to be like. So that may be it. But there's a few problems with that. The second view is that this is a, a vision of Zerubbabel's temple. So if you do the timeline, 586, the temple of Solomon is destroyed completely. 70 years later, Zerubbabel is going to build. So that's 517, 516. And we're in between there. We're 14 years after the destruction of the temple, but like uh, 56 years before the building of it. So some would say this is a vision that God gave to Ezekiel of the temple, temple that Zerubbabel is supposed to build. And that would make logical sense. Like, Zerubbabel, tell your people, we're going to build a temple again. And this is how you're going to do it. This is how big it is and how big the walls are and whatever. So that is the view of some. Again, there's a few problems with it. Like when Zerubbabel built, he never built this one. <laughs> the dimensions are wrong, the, si the location's wrong. I mean, it, it doesn't even begin to match what Zerubbabel would do. So this was, to some people, uh, looking back to Solomon's, to some people it's looking forward to when you guys go back, Zerubbabel's going to lead you, you build this thing. You got the blueprints. You know what you're supposed to do. Um, that one's a little bit better than the first one, but it doesn't match it at all, and you realize... Uh, from what we know, the glory of the Lord that never re-entered Zerubbabel's temple. All right, so as far there's just a lot of problems with it, but some people would hold to that. The third view is the allegorical view, which is a little different than symbolic. Every element is simply an allegorical detail of Jesus Christ. 
So you understand when, when in about the third and fourth century AD, they came up with the uh, allegorical method of interpretation. And it's plagued us ever since. But so everything you read has four meanings, right? One is the literal, one is the personal, one is the future, and one is the allegorical. So, and the allegorical always points to Jesus. So if I said Jerusalem, there's a literal meaning to that. There is a place. And there is an allegorical meaning. It's Jesus. There's a personal. That's where God dwells in my life. And there's a future that someday, you know, there's going to be God dwelling something somehow. So they did that. And so if you read the commentaries, 3rd, 4th, 5th century A.D., they always had four interpretations, those four. The allegorical would say, this is a, you read it, and the intent of God is for you to get an image of Jesus. All right? And so all the words that I ask you to give help you to understand Jesus. He's organized, he's detailed, he's specific, he's whatever. But I think many of us struggle with that a lot. So it seems like, nah, there's more to it. So some say it's symbolic. So I have some quotes. I don't know if I got them here. No command is given anywhere in the course of the vision that the Israelites were to build this temple. This vision had its fulfillment in the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So the temple was the dwelling place of God. And you understand in the New Testament, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So what Ezekiel was really talking about when he said so many cubits and so many lines of flax and whatever, what he was really talking about, there's coming a day when the church would be born on the day of Pentecost and the Spirit of God would come and live within us and that God would be our, you know, we would be the dwelling place of God. So that is by far the majority view of Christians in the world today. It never said you got to build it. It only says it's the dwelling place of God and it's, it's all that so you understand what a great privilege it is to have the Spirit of God living within you. Well, that is a great privilege, right? And Pentecost did happen. Here's another quote, I think. It represents the Lord's provision for dwelling in the midst of His people in the new age. And that quote goes on to say, as the old temple was an embodied representation of God's relationship to Israel under the old dispensation, so the temple of this vision is a symbolic representation of his relationship to the new Israel when redeemed and restored. In other words, we're the temple of God, the church, we the people are the temple of God, and we represent God wherever we go. And just like the Old Testament temple was a real place where people could you know, understand there was a God and he dwelt with glory, so we are to be that, okay? So they usually would, uh, I think I have one more, I think, yeah, Hamilton said, not that they... Not that we are to expect any of the details themselves given in Ezekiel to be taken literally or fulfilled literally, but that the truths represented by these details will be realized in the new heaven and new earth. So some people say it's symbolic of the Spirit of God dwells in you. And when you read Ezekiel 40, 41, 42, 43, you understand what that means. And some would say it's symbolic of the new heaven and the new earth. That's what it's going to be in a symbolic way. It's going to be glorious, it's going to be great, all those kinds of things. So, you know, that's the, that's the uh, fourth way of understanding. The last way, I think I have to go back to this one, is to see that it's future. It's the messianic or millennial temple. There will be a temple built in the future this are the dimensions, this is the purpose, this is how it's going to do, all right? And it's going to happen in the future. So I think I have a quote or two on that one as well. And it, well I guess not. So anyway, what you understand, it would be a future millennial kingdom, all right? So why is that so difficult? Well, if you don't believe there is a future millennium, that's a huge problem, right? So many people do not believe there's going to be a millennium. They're called a ah, millennialist, no millennium. All right? So it, if there is no millennium, there will not be a temple. So it cannot be that someday in the future this thing is actually going to get built, right? So we have to look at it. So what are their objections? By the way, when you, when you have a debate on 
amillennialism and premillennialism. That there is going to be a millennium. In other words, covenant theology, replacement theology on one side, and dispensational theology on the other. They love to run to Ezekiel 40 through 43 because they got you. If you're premillennialist, they got you here. And here's why. The style. It's not the same as in the past. Gotcha. And you go, maybe it's a new style. All right? But they would really play that. The whole passage differs too much from anything in the past to allow for a moment the supposition that this is historical in character. It must therefore be prophetic, symbolic representation of us indwelt by the Spirit of God. All right? So they say that the style is it's just not the same. There's no Ark of the Covenant, and there's nothing in the past that matches this. So, it, you know, therefore, there can't be anything in the future that would look like this. They would say the size. As you know, the size is huge. Go to Jerusalem. Try to find one square mile of flat land <laughs> on top of, of, of the city of Jerusalem. And, you know, like it can't fit doesn't work. I don't know where they'd build it. And so that's a problem, and, and they seem like they might have a, an answer for that. However, if you think about it, we're going to go next week to Ezekiel 44 through 48, and you can read in Zechariah, I think it is, and some other places, before the return of Christ in the millennial kingdom, God's going to rearrange the earth. <laughs> He's got this great big bulldozer. He's going to, you know, all right? And we're going to see that next week. The tribes will be different. The, the land will be, there'll be a river flowing where into the Dead Sea where people are fishing, right? So it doesn't fit the current topography. You can't find a place in Jerusalem today where this would fit. It's too big. But what if God rearranges the world? <laughs> do you think he could do that? <laughs> well, you have to believe he could do that. The third one is the sacrifice. Let's go to the system. It seems to be that it's reverting back to the Old Testament with a temple and priest and sacrifices for sin and all that stuff. And the book of Hebrews would tell us God did away with that. And, and we don't need that. The old system was okay, but the new system is better. So it seems like it's reverting back to an Old Testament system and, and we don't need it. And God told us in Hebrews that the Old Testament's not coming back. So this is their main gotcha. And it goes with the third one, their sacrifices. So we are told in Hebrews, chapter, many chapters, chapter 8, 9, 10, 11 in specific, you know, the, the sacrifices, you know. But Jesus was the sacrifice once for all. So why would we ever go back? Why would God ever go back to a sacrificial system? Because that's what's described. Priest in a temple with an altar with blood sacrifices. And so they really think they got you there because it can't be something in the future. There cannot be animal sacrifices in the future. And therefore, this cannot be true. Therefore, it has to be symbolic. Therefore, it cannot be that God's going to build a real temple someday. And all of God's people said, you're not supposed to say amen to that one. <laughs> so you want me to let you think about it all week? What's your answer? I don't think it'd do any good. I mean, you think about it all week. Wouldn't do you any good. All right. Yeah. So what would be wrong with God coming up with a whole new system? Not as an Old Testament system of law and sacrifice in that sense, but, you know, every week, in fact, this Sunday, I think we have communion. Is that right, this Sunday? I think we do, right? How, how often do we do that? Like once a month? Some churches do it once a week, whatever. Why do we do that? So it helps us to remember that it was a day... 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. His blood was shed and he died for my sins, right? So God wants us to remember. In the Old Testament, you remember, all the sacrifices, what Hebrews really is saying, they didn't do any good. 
That didn't mean they were worthless, because God, just like communion, does it do you any good? Like if it really made me a better Christian, I'd be taking communion five times a day. You know, I want as much as I can get of that. But it's a remembrance, right? In the Old Testament, all those sacrifices were not because they took care of sin, but they reminded them of their sin. and reminded them, someday you need the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They were looking forward. We're looking back, right? So the sacrifices themselves, Hebrew is not saying they were bad. He's saying they just didn't, they didn't save people. You know, they were a reminder. They were, you know, it was, and you can imagine killing your lamb. <laughs> that would really remind you the wages of sin is really bad. So why not in the future that God would reestablish a temple? It's going to be a little different than the Old Testament. It's going to have different rooms, different chambers, different roles. And he's going to have blood sacrifices as a remembrance. Why, why can't that be? Why can't that be? And I, my time is up. We're going to spend a little bit of time with that next week. But I want you to know that um, there's really no reason it couldn't. When it comes to style, I read that. When it comes to size, the dimensions are wrong. But we're going to find Ezekiel 44 through 48. He gives new dimensions to the land, new topography. Uh, the new temple will be uh, built in the north of the city of Jerusalem, not in the city of Jerusalem in Ezekiel. The old system, it's not a reversion to the old. The death of Christ ended animal sacrifices, not Hebrews 9, 10, uh, 10. And so it is impossible to conceive in view of the whole relation between old and new dispensations set forth in the scripture that animal sacrifices will ever again be restored. But I think the truth is, so they end up with their symbolic, but I think... Why should not the temple, the rites and the sacrifices, be allowed to point to the lamb that was slain? It's just another way for God to say, this is how I want you to remember what Jesus Christ did and what provided the salvation for you. We're going to spend, my time is up, so we've got to end, but I'm going to spend a little time on that, that it's not to say he will never again have sacrifices. I don't know where you get it. And it seems to me he is saying there will be a day in the future when there will be a temple, there will be sacrifices. It is not a reversion to the Old Testament and the Old Testament law system, but it is a reminder in the future of what the Lamb of God did. Now you're totally confused. <laughs> and that's why Mer Merle Unger said it is perhaps the most difficult passage in the Bible. Because the sacrifice thing bothers us, right? It just bothers you, right? They, they, they we're never going to do sacrifices again. But the question is, why? It was not wrong in the past. Why would it be wrong in the future? And why would it take away from anything that Jesus Christ did? Those didn't take away from what he did. They were never saved by sacrificing they were always saved by looking to the one who would die for their sins. Our time is up. I made it. I'm going to survive it. And I really believe that there is a purpose, and I'm going to bring that out next week. Why in the world would God want to reinstitute a temple? Would start, why? Why not just have communion? Why in the millennium is it so important for the Jewish people to do that? And I think there's an answer to that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word of God. And everybody can read it and everybody will conclude exactly what it says, dimensions, all those kinds of things. But Father, we recognize that over the ages we have struggled with what, what, what really could this be? And I pray, Father, that you would help us to trust your word and realize there is a purpose you have for all that you're going to do in the future, that someday you will reestablish Israel in the land, and you will have the restoration of a worship and a temple. And we pray, Father, that we would see this as uh, your plan for the ages, and we trust you for that. Now I pray, Father, more than anything else, we'd remember that everything points to one person. His name is Jesus Christ. And that he died for our sins. And whether we were Moses in the Old Testament or Abraham and sacrificing animals, it was to remind us of that. And whether we're in the New Testament with the Lord's Supper, 
it's to remind us of that. We're in the millennium, Father. I pray that it would be a benefit for us to grasp that Christ died for our sins. Thank you again. Bless our time this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.